Hi all and welcome back to my YouTube channel. For the ones that don't know me, my name is Marcel Vandenberg and I'm a Paddy Platinum course director. In this video, I want to go over the Paddy Open Water Diver Manual Answers of chapter number one. Hopefully this will help you to prepare for your Paddy Open Water Diver course, or if you're already in the course, this will help you to complete your dive theory and prepare you for the Paddy Open Water Diver exam. All right, with no further ado, let's get into this Paddy Open Water Diver Manual Answers of chapter number one video. All right, right now, when you are listening to this video, you're actually surrounded by pressure already. And what pressure is that? That's the air pressure that's surrounding us. I know you don't really feel it right now because you're kind of used to it and you know, we're born into this pressure. However, there is a bit of pressure on top of us. Now, how much pressure that is? That is right now one bar or one atmosphere. To keep it a bit simple, to not mix it all the time, let's just focus on one bar right now, but they are the same thing with atmosphere. Okay, when we're going scuba diving, we're gonna go under the water, which means that we now have an increase of pressure around us. Why? It's because now suddenly we're surrounded by water, which also weighs something and that puts pressure on top of us. Now we still have the surface, the air pressure also on us right now when we are going under the water. And that's very important to know to understand this question. Well, first of all, how much pressure do we have around us under the water? Well, for every 10 meters that you're going under the water, the pressure increases by one bar. So for example, when we're going scuba diving and we're gonna go down to 10 meters of depth, you're gonna have one bar of pressure above you. Then also we still have the pressure from the surface like I just said. So we're actually having two bar of pressure at 10 meters. One bar from the water and then one bar from the surface air pressure also. So let's say right now we're going to 20 meters. So we're going down to 10 meters first, one bar. Now we're descending even more to 20 meters, another one bar, so that's two bar but plus the one from the surface is three bar. So we're going to 30 meters, one, two, three bar, plus the one from the surface is four bar. All right, 40 meters, I kind of think you guessed it now already, five bar, and how much bar do we have in pressure at 18 meters? Yes, very, very good, nine bar of pressure. Now, don't think you're gonna go scuba diving to 80 meters, not yet. Your first two dives will be to a maximum depth of 12 meters, and then your dive three and four of the Petty Open Water course will be to a maximum depth of 18 meters. And then with the proper training, like taking the advanced course, you can go up to 30 meters, and you can also choose to do a specialty later to go up to 40 meters. But that will be your limit as a recreational scuba diver. If you wanna go deeper than 40 meters, that's possible too, but this is technical diving. If you wanna know a lot more information about your advanced course, the deep specialty, or maybe technical diving, go and ask your instructor and he can tell you all about it. Now, besides increasing the pressure when we are going deeper, we also have an effect on volume and on density. Okay, so how does this work? Let's say that we fully inflate a balloon at the surface, like, I don't know, it's your birthday or something. So you fully inflate it, now there's air in it, and now you put a knot in it. Okay, air, same as anything else, in a simple way of saying it, is made out of molecules. So it is something. When we are going under the water with that balloon now, the water is going to surround it, and it's gonna put pressure on that balloon, on all sides. So the more deeper we go, the more pressure, and the more that's gonna squeeze in that balloon. So when we're going down to 10 meters, remember from before, we have two bar of pressure there, so it doubles from one bar at the surface to two bar at 10 meters. That means the balloon gets squeezed into half the size. So the volume becomes half. So that air doesn't escape. A lot of people think, oh, where does the air go then? But the molecules kind of they get squeezed together a bit closer. So for this reason, the density inside of the balloon actually increases. So when we're going down, when we're descending, the volume decreases and the density increases. How much does this density increase? Well, that's always related to the pressure that you're under. So that's kind of simple. So when you first find out that it's two bar pressure at 10 meters, that means the, the density is times two. 
Okay, so let's say, for example, we're going down to 30 meters. So remember at 30 meters, we got one bar first to 10, another bar to 20, another bar to 30, so that's four bar. So if we take that balloon down, it gets squeezed in four times as much, so one four to volume. And that means the density inside of that balloon, the thickness, is now times four. All right, and then the last one, remember, if we take the balloon down all the way down to 40 meters, then the balloon will be one fifth of its size. Why is this important? Well, when we're going to go under the water, like we just discussed in question number one, we're going to have an increase of pressure around us, which means we have to equalize our air spaces that we have inside of our body. So where do we have these uh, air spaces? Well, we have what we call sinuses, and the sinuses are behind our face. And connected to those sinuses, we've got these eustachian, if I can pronounce it correctly, eustachian tubes that go to our ears, and they connect to our eardrum that we have in our ear. We also have an airspace right here that goes down to the biggest airspace, which is our lungs. We also have a little bit of air in between our face and our mask, and we also have to equalize that, but that is something we're gonna explain a little bit later. For now, let's focus on the ears mostly, because that's where you feel the pressure first, and that's what we need to equalize first. If you wonder, by the way, if you need to equalize your arms or toes, during a scuba dive? No, you don't. You know, that, that can't get squeezed in because we don't have uh, any air spaces there. So only when we have our air spaces is really where the water wants to go to on our first scuba dives. So let's say tomorrow you're gonna do your first dive. Picture your first dive and you're on the surface and let's say that you're using a descent line to go down, so you're holding onto this line, you deflate that BCD, and now we want you to start equalizing when we're going down. And why is because if this is your eardrum, this is the outside of your ear, this is, and then here you got your eustachian tube. The moment we go down under the water, the water will flow into your ear, into your sort of ear canal on the, on the outside, and it's gonna start putting a little bit of pressure on that eardrum, and it's gonna start bending it a little bit. This is not bad for your eardrum, and you might not even feel this yet. So this is really in those first few like centimeters this is starts happening and yeah, you kind of go like, oh, this is fine, you know, easy. I don't have any issues with my ears. But if you're gonna go down more and more without equalizing what you shouldn't do, then what's gonna happen is that the water's gonna press it in more and more and more until you start feeling, oh, there's something in my ear. And then more and more it becomes uncomfortable and if you keep going and going, yeah, the eardrum at one point uh, might get damaged. So I know this sounds a bit scary, but don't worry, it's very, very easy to solve and that is by equalizing our ears. So how do we equalize it? Well, basically what we're trying to do is to create the same pressure inside as we have outside. And that is where our rear lungs come into play as well. So what we can do, if when you're going down on the water, the water flows in, bends in your eardrum a bit, just do version number A, which we also call the Velzelva maneuver. Basically what you do, you pinch your nose, you breathe out, but you close your mouth also, so it cannot actually go out. Then the air will go through your nose, but it cannot go out here as well. I know I speak a bit funny like this. Huh? And then what happens, it gets pushed to our eustachian tubes, to our eardrum. And then the air goes like this, so when we're going down, it goes like this, and then whoop, and then and you press it back like that. This doesn't have to be hard. Actually doing it hard is really bad because you might now damage something else. So just gently, That's kind of how it works. Not hard at all. Now the trick is though to do it as much as you can. Okay, so you go all the way until you're down to where you have to be. You can also use a different technique if this doesn't work and that is to wiggle your jaw like this and move your head maybe from side to side. Actually you can try it right now if you want to. I know, no one's looking right, it looks a bit weird. But you just go can you feel it? Can you feel your, your ears squeaking? Right, I can feel it. For me, it's not the most preferred way of equalizing my ears. Uh, most people, like myself, we just love the first one, which is the Velzelva maneuver. Just works so well. You can actually try that now as well, but always be careful, especially on land, to never do it too hard. So just very gently, just to see if you feel something. 
If you don't feel something or only one ear, don't worry too. It's probably because you have a little bit of congestion blocking your sinuses or your, or your eustachian tube. So make sure you blow your nose before you do this and make sure that you don't have a cold or that you're sick before you go scuba diving. If you're not sure, check up with a physician just before you do your dive. Works fantastically. Now, if you have a feeling on your first dive that it's, or you have to still go into your confined water session and it's just not working, just talk to your instructor. I know you sometimes feel like you might be, you know, uh, special or something weird going on with you because everybody else can equalize. But trust me, many people have issues with equalizing in the beginning because it's kind of like a feeling and it gets better and better over time. You really start to feel exactly when you have to equalize. And everyone is different as well. So if everybody in the group can equalize except for you, that's perfectly normal. I pretty much have never, I think, taught an, an open water course where everybody could equalize. There was always one, two or three people having some issues. And then in the end, sometimes they were even better at equalizing than the others because they sort of focused on it more. So don't worry at all. Only when you're really sick, then it just doesn't work whatever you do. And then it's time to stop and then just continue your course or your diving at another time. Anytime you're in doubt, just ask your instructor or ask a dive physician. So I just mentioned that you should equalize all the time when you're going down until you get to the depth that you want to go and then continue your dive and look at cool stuff. But I know you guys are going to be excited and that's important. But what we see a lot with new divers is that when they're going down in the first few meters, let's say up to three meters, they're so focused on this equalizing. So they're holding the line, you know, you're equalizing and just, oh yeah, it works. Okay, this is weird. Oh, it's kind of working. This is good. So it's all good. But then after a few meters, you look down and whoa, and suddenly there's this beautiful reef and you see all these beautiful fish and you're going, wow, and you want to go there. And then we see get our students getting a bit too excited and it might now go down without equalizing. And then of course you kind of feel it. If it happens or this happens and you start going, oh, what's happening to my ears? Just stop. You can never make it worse when you stop. So that's good to know. And then signal your body and your instructor, dive master, whoever is around you, that you have a problem with your ears. So this is the signal. I have a problem with my ears. At that point, what you need to do to solve it is just to go up a little bit and do so slowly. Probably your instructor or dive master will tell you to go up as well when you give them the signal that there's something wrong with your ears. All right, so just very gently and slowly you go up. But the cool thing is you don't have to go up all the way back up to the surface. If you could equalize at three meters and you can't equalize at four meters, you just go up just very slowly to three meters again. And what happens is, so for example, the reason why we can't equalize, we call this a squeeze, is when the air pressure outside is more than the pressure inside and it's too much. So you went to this point and you just went, oh, it doesn't work. Remember, never do it too hard. So by going up gently back to around three meters, your eardrum starts bending back by itself. Yeah, at three meters it was equalized so there you just go ah, it works again and then just keep doing it all the time and then you're going to be fine if it really doesn't work you can go up a little bit more to try that out and in very rare occasions it just doesn't work at all and then you might have to go back up all the way to the surface but this is usually then more because again you have congestion in your sinuses that you didn't know about before and uh, your instructor will probably ask you to blow your nose at the surface get all that stuff out and then give it another go. But again, there's a difference between having a little bit of congestion in there that you just need to get rid of or having a cold and being sick. So if your instructor feels like that you might be too sick at that point, he might then ask you to uh, cancel the dive and then continue on another dive when you feel better. Sometimes we see students forcing it, which means that they see the, the other group going, they feel pressured because they're the only one that are slow and having issues with the ears, or maybe just really want to complete this course and you're on a holiday and you have to leave and you're just under this pressure and you just think like, ah, oh, you know what, it, it doesn't hurt that much, but it feels really uncomfortable. I'm just going to push it through. No, this is really important that you don't do this because you can damage that eardrum and then you cannot die for a very long time. Sometimes you just need one night of good rest to be able to continue the next day. 
So whenever you feel something, let your instructor know. He will give you the best advice. Maybe check yourself up with a doctor if you need to, and then continue your diving. But never, ever, ever force equalizing. By the way, if you want to learn more about equalizing your ears, I actually made a full video with some of the best tricks that you can use, way more than I just discussed, um, to equalize your ears, especially good for beginner divers. So after this video, check out my video section and scroll down or use the search bar and then look for my how to equalize your ears while scuba diving to watch that video afterwards. Well, I think we just answered that multiple times. Absolutely, when you're waiting too long, you're gonna feel always that uncomfortable feeling. It's hard to equalize. And when you're really too long, then it's just you can't do it. You get that squeeze and you have to go back up. So just do it all the time. Like this until you go down. Once you get experience, do you really have to like do this all the time on the way down? Maybe not. Maybe you just find that perfect feeling and moment when you have to equalize. But when you're a new diver, it really, really helps. I sometimes get students back after dive number one saying, oh, you know, I'm not sure this scuba diving is for me. I have some, I, I had to equalize all the time. And I always react like, wow, that's great. Um, because that makes you prevent having an uncomfortable feeling. And also remember that when you're doing dive one and two, we're still diving quite shallow, up to 12 meters. That means that the, the pressure pretty much doubles when you're going to 10 meters, remember, from one bar to two bar, which means that we have a huge pressure difference. So anytime you're going up and down a little bit, you have to equalize again, all of us, including the instructor and the dive master. So don't worry, it's perfectly normal. Absolutely, never ever ever dive when you're sick. And if you don't know if you're sick, check yourself up with a doctor. And if you can, a dive physician would even be better. Sometimes we think we're like, oh yeah, you know, I can handle this. It's just a little bit of a cold. But remember that this time we're going under the water, we're going scuba diving and everything is connected. Your sinuses, you're under pressure. And it is so important that we are healthy when we go scuba diving. There's always another dive. Now you might wonder, but what if I take medication? I take all that congestion out, it clears my sinuses, then it's easy for me to equalize. Well, yeah, in theory that makes sense. However, they did some studies and in some cases, some medication can cause extra side effects when we're under the pressure. Some are maybe wearing off during the dive especially, which means that you might be okay going down or descending or being down on the dive, but then in the end when you're going up and the medication wears off and there's more congestion inside of your sinuses, now you might get a blockage on your ascent. And it's really not so easy, of course, to solve any colds or illnesses when we're scuba diving. So that's what we have to do on land. We have to sick it out, drink water, and make sure you check with a doctor before your next dive. All right, you might have heard this already before, you might have read about it, and you might have worried a little bit going, oh my God, this looks a little bit scary. Because the most important rule, the answer is to never, ever, ever hold your breath and to always continuously breathe when we're scuba diving. And why is this so important? Is because when we're breathing all the time under the water, we're actually equalizing as well. And what are we equalizing now mostly is our lungs. So remember every airspace we have to equalize. To equalize our ears, you just pinch your nose and breathe out and wiggle your jaws. But we can't really pinch our lungs anywhere. It doesn't really work. So how do we equalize it? Very simple, just breathe. So breathe in and equalize and breathe out and equalize and breathe in, equalize and breathe out, equalize. So it sounds all a little bit scary about, oh my God, what can you know, we do to prevent that we're having lung issues, but the solution is the easiest, which is just to breathe. Let's say that you don't. So for example, you are at a specific depth and you decide to take a huge deep breath in, hold it, and now decide to ascend, um, maybe even fast. Yeah, this is bad. And this can now damage your lung 
and might actually cause really bad injury or it can even lead to death. And this is why the most important rule of scuba diving is to never hold your breath and to always keep breathing. Now you might go right now, well wait a second, when I was swimming in the pool normally, I always take a breath and then swim down a bit and come back up. That's okay, because you're not scuba diving, you're sort of free diving like we like to call it. So that means you're taking a breath on the surface. And what happens now is like blowing up a balloon at the surface, like we just discussed, putting a knot in it. It's the same thing as at the surface going and holding it, because your lungs are kind of balloons. And when you hold your breath, it's like putting a knot in it. Now, when you now swim down under the water, then the pressure of the water is going to squeeze in your lungs, same as when we squeeze in a balloon. But now when we're going up again to the surface, we have less pressure, so your lungs now expand again to its normal size at the surface. Same as when we take a balloon down, it will get squeezed in a bit, and when we take it back up, it expands to its normal size. But that's called free diving. We are scuba diving which basically means that we're breathing under the water. So let's say that you are at a specific depth and you take a breath from your regulator. It's the same as blowing up a balloon under the water all the way to the max, putting a knot in it, and now it's a fully inflated balloon under the water, and now you bring it up, yeah, the balloon's still gonna expand because there's less pressure to the point it might go So remember, our lungs are like balloons. So if you take that breath under the water and you hold it, it's like that knot, you go up now, now your lung will expand to the point it might get damaged or even worse. I don't think your lung is going to explode or you explode like that. That's a bit too much. But yeah, even a tiny crack or cut or, or damage of the cells can lead to some serious consequences. Now you might go like, oh my God, wait, 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 wait. Ooh, uh, what if I hold my breath, right? I know this is something that a lot of new students think. But you gotta find out when you're going scuba diving, especially in the beginning, I think it's really exciting. You know, there's all these beautiful things to see and we always breathe. I mean, do you normally hold your breath when you're in the supermarket? Not really, right? So most people come back from that first dive saying, oh, you know, I was really worried about holding my breath, but I never even thought about it. So don't worry too much. Just make sure that you're not all the water and go, and then start to ascend. And if you ever feel like you wanna hold your breath, I never heard this or seen this before, just signal your instructor and say, I'm not so cool, I don't know why, uh, and just go back up to the surface with him slowly and then discuss the next step, okay? Don't worry too much, but it's important to never hold your breath under the water. All right, so that means we're halfway through to your petty open water diver manual answers of chapter number one. I hope you're liking it. I hope it's helping you so far. And if it does, please don't forget to hit that like button under this video because that will help me a lot. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel and ring that notification bell so you get notified when I upload future training videos. Of course, the next video will be chapter number two, chapter number three, four, and five. So if you want to watch all the chapters, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. All right, let's get into question number eight. So this right now is the opposite of a squeeze. So when we go down and you didn't equalize, you get a squeeze. This is when we're going up and we can't equalize. You might get what we call a reverse block. Now, on the way up, we don't actually have to do anything special to equalize. We don't have to pinch our noses or anything like that. The same as how we equalize our lungs, we just have to breathe normally. Because what happens? We're adding air into our sinuses on the way down to equalize that airspace. So now when we're going up, there's less pressure around us. So the air inside of our sinuses, it's gonna expand outwards. Now, all of it is connected to our nose and to our mouth. So we're just breathing that air out. And you don't even feel that, which is fantastic. So you can just swim up slowly to the surface in the end of the dive. But if you have a little bit of congestion, or a lot, or you do have a cold and you didn't listen to a recommendation about don't dive when you're sick, you might find that that congestion is now somewhere blocking the sinus or your eustachian tube, so the air cannot ex uh, expand there. And that gives you an uncomfortable feeling, and that can happen anywhere. Usually people feel it right here, you know, like this area here, but it can also happen here or with your ears. Now, if that happens, what you do, you just go back down a little bit. Remember, stopping will never make it worse. 
And when you go down, the air gets squeezed in a little bit in our sinuses, which is fantastic, instantly feels better. And then just swim back up again, but now much slower. And then what happens if there is a little bit of air inside of your sinus, it just like sort of builds up that pressure and then just squeezes past any blockage that you have. And it's actually really relieving feeling. It's like, oh, oh. I had it once in my whole uh, career. Um, and it was actually a kind of relieving feeling when it's squeezed out. However, try not to now look for that. Uh, I don't die when you're sick, but, uh, but yeah, it's kind of nice to know when it comes out, it, it kind of feels nice. Another trick that you can do if that doesn't work is, is maybe blow your nose under the water. This is a really cool trick, but make sure you keep your mask on your face, don't take it off, and just put your finger on the side like you normally blow your nose, you just go, and it, okay, that goes into the mask, but, but who cares? And then just clear it by breathing out of your nose, you will learn how to clear your mask uh, later on when you're doing the skills, and then try to now go slower, and then probably because there's no congestion, it squeezes out quite easily. There's a cool little trick, uh, don't just try this out, talk about it with your instructor just before you do this. Always make sure though that when you have an issue with a reverse block, that you always communicate to your body and to your instructor that you have a problem with some pressure in your sinuses and then of course your instructor will help you uh, to go descend a little bit and then go up a little bit slower when it happens. By the way, having a reverse block is very rare. So if you're worrying a little bit about it, don't worry too much. Uh, but it can happen. Another way that you can have a reverse block as well, before we move on to the next question, is maybe when you have like a filling that hasn't been done correctly, or you've done a root canal recently or something like that. So if you just went to the dentist for any issues, maybe let your instructor know as well before the dive so that he's aware of it. But a good dentist will always make your teeth in a way that this doesn't really become an issue. Remember from question number one, is that when we are going under the water, that we have an increase of pressure surrounding us. This affects how fast we go through our air supply. I know this sounds a little bit strange, but let me explain it to you. Okay, assume that we have a scuba tank with full, let's say 200 bar of pressure, and you will be breathing from it from a regulator on the surface. I'm going to time you with a watch. And at one point, you breathe all the air from the scuba tank, so it's empty. I stop my watch, and it took you one hour to empty the tank. Now, it doesn't actually maybe take you one hour in real life. It might take you faster or shorter, just for this example. Okay, so at the surface, with one bar of pressure, it takes you one hour to completely empty that tank. So now if you take that tank down to 10 meters, and you go down as well, of course, with your regulator in, and now you start breathing from that tank, Remember that the pressure at 10 meters is two bar. So it doubles from one bar from the surface to two bar. Now, because the pressure doubles, we now actually use our air twice as fast. So if you breathe from it, and then at one point it will be empty, I will stop my watch, and you breathe kind of the same as on the surface, let's assume that, then you should empty that tank in around 30 minutes. So how much faster do we then use our air compared to the surface? Well, that's very easy to find out because it's kind of the same number as the pressure that you are under. So when we're at 20 meters, we are three bar, so our air consumption goes three times as fast. When we are at 40 meters, we are at five bar. This means that our air consumption will go five times as fast. So when you look at the question right now, and it says here, when we're going diving to 18 meters, which will probably be your maximum depth on dive number three or four, on your open water dive, of course, you're gonna find out that your air consumption will go faster than when you dive at 10 meters, which you probably go to on dive one or two because the maximum depth for that is 12 meters. Now, don't worry too much right now. Some new divers, and actually I was one of them when I started my open water dive, of course, sometimes they worry a little bit going, oh my God, you know, it's gonna be okay in the confined water and dive one and two, but then when I do dive three and four, maybe my needle's gonna drop like that. Or, I might not want to do the advanced course because then we're going to 30 meters and that is four bars or so four times faster. Oh no, I'm going to run out of air too quick. No, you won't. It doesn't mean that your needle is going to drop like that. But the deeper we go, it will go a bit faster. So we always recommend you to breathe really long and deep, slow breaths, be super chilled out 
and not just on deep dives, but on shallow dives also. Now, in the beginning, you're a little bit excited. That's one of the reasons why we go nice and shallow. But once you do more and more dives, you be more and more relaxed and you find out you can easily go to 30 meters or even 40 meters and still have a long, good air supply. And in the end, we never really go up anyway when the air runs out. We always go up way before that. I always recommend at 70 bar, it's time to start making your ascent. You might have a bit of a shorter dive, but you still saw some incredible stuff at depth as well, and it will get better over time. So don't worry too much. All right, question number 10 of this Petty Open Water Manual. Now you're gonna find out that this question is gonna come back a few more times. And actually, when you're doing multiple courses in the future, you're gonna hear about this a lot too. If you ever want to become a diving instructor, and hopefully you will sign up with my Petty IDC course. By the way, you find the link in the description below. If you're interested, um, you're gonna hear a lot about it because it's kind of like a baby of mine. I, I Some people, are never nervous, they love diving, they're never scared. But some people, they are a bit nervous. And it doesn't mean they're not good divers or they shouldn't dive. Actually, with a little bit of good training and some more experience, they might even become better divers than the people that were never nervous. But what I've noticed in my career, that almost, almost any panic attack that happens to someone under the water actually comes from people being overexerted under the water and being overexerted can be multiple reasons now here in the question it says that you look at fish you're excited and, and and you're trying to chase it and you're using too much energy and now you sort of uh, get short on breath and, and and that's an uncomfortable feeling under the water uh, it's actually very common for new divers because we see a lot of divers they go down for the first time on the dive site and you know they don't really see anything yet so they really focus on the equalizing and stuff like that but then they start seeing the reef and the beautiful fish and they go woo and they try to chase it and they want to go everywhere but the more we move our hands the more we use our legs the more we swim the more we get excited the more energy we need and, and the more energy we need the more oxygen we need as well so people start to breathe much more much more shallower all our muscles and stuff like that need oxygen you might go like, yeah, but I wasn't moving that fast. I mean, on the surface, I'm running all the time and I don't really get out of breath that quick. But that's because the water is much more denser than air. And, you know, it's much more resistance. So doing a movement like this in air might not take that much energy, but doing the same movement in water might take a lot more energy. So that's why we're trying to be like, like Zen masters under the water. I'm always uh, a lot of like energy on surface. I'm always like, yay, let's go, let's do this. But then under the water, you should see me. I'm like, I rarely even kick my legs. It's just, and I just look at beautiful stuff under the water. Another kick and breathe. It's really, really nice and gentle. Other reasons maybe why you can maybe get a bit overexerted is maybe swimming against strong currents. Um, having a GoPro or a camera, like I don't wanna be against it at all. Like I love, I mean, I'm, I'm filming right now. I, I love photography, I love videography. But in the beginning when you're unexperienced, you're still busy a bit with your buoyancy and clearing your mask and you know, trying to really enjoy the reef as well. And, and sometimes people, when they take the cameras too quick, they're like all over the place with this camera trying to chase stuff. And actually you don't really see that much anyway because you're so focused on the camera. So my recommendation when you're doing your first dives, maybe leave the camera on the side and then you know start using it when you have a few more dives or when you're doing your advanced course or at least when you're certified open water. But that doesn't mean that you cannot uh, use a camera um, if you really want to talk it over with your instructor and then absolutely enjoy it just be careful because the more we use it the more energy and the faster our air goes and the more we have a chance to get overexerted all right with overexerted though you might go like ah oh, come on overexerted I, I just i just catch my breath yeah but because we have a bit of a dead airspace here and under the water again we have a lot of pressure on top of us is that when you start breathing very shallow <laughs> you're building up a lot of carbon dioxide in your body, which triggers more and more breathing. And, and at one point you're gonna feel like you can't get enough air and you start thinking your regulator's broken or stuff like that. And that leads to panic and that leads 
people maybe uh, bolting to the surface and, and that's also not good, right? So you might go like, oh no, I don't want to do that. What, what happens if I get overexerted? Well, that's this answer to this question. It's really easy to solve. Just stop whatever you're doing. You know, when you start to go <laughs> like this and maybe hold on to your body, that really helps as well. And then just, Catch that breath. And that goes actually quite quick. So you can solve it very quickly. And no, we don't really always have to go up to the surface. But if you don't stop and rest and you keep going, <laughs> you can keep swimming and stuff, yeah, then it can lead to an uncontrollable hyperventilation and then you might panic and go up. So be a bit careful there. But again, we can prevent everything, anything of this happening by just diving as slow and relaxed as possible. If you feel that your body's going too fast or your instructor, please tell them because they should slow down to your speed. We should always adjust to the slowest speed of the person in the group, unless certain conditions don't allow it. Okay, an object is neutrally buoyant when it displaces the same amount of water that it weighs. So when you put something in the water, it pushes water aside. If you take that volume of the water that is being pushed away and you would weigh that, it should weigh the same as the actual object itself. Then something's neutrally buoyant. And with neutrally buoyant or buoyancy, we mean that something is sort of like in one place. It's not really floating up. It's not really sinking down. It's kind of, it's kind of just there. Positive buoyancy means that it's displacing more water than the object actually weighs. This gives like an upward force and that makes it sort of like gets pushed up to the surface or float up to the surface. And a negative buoyancy is when we're displacing less water than the object weighs. It's really heavy and it, it just goes down. One of the reasons why, for example, uh, you put a coin, you know, on your toe, on your feet, it doesn't hurt, it's, it's very light, but when you put it in the water, it sinks. But when we put, for example, a cruise ship on our toe, don't do that, it's gonna hurt. You don't have a toe anymore, right? Or a foot. But we put it in water, it floats. And why? It's because the cruise ship is designed in a way that it pushes, displaces more water than the whole object weighs. So it actually gets pushed to the surface. While the coin is designed in a certain shape that it doesn't really displace that much water, but it's really, really heavy, it just, it just goes down. That's kind of how it works. So let's go back to the question. So in freshwater, if the object now displays the same amount of weight, it's neutrally buoyant. But if you put the same object in salt water, it will float. But why? It's because salt water is a little bit more denser than freshwater because it has salt in it. And because it has salt in it, it's a little bit more heavier. And that means that it displays the same amount of water than in freshwater, but when you weigh that water, it's a little bit more heavier. So it displaces a bit more water than it weighs in weight. And that means it gets pushed up to the surface. Can't, you can't get around the safety part, having a buddy. And what does actually buddy mean? Is that you are diving together with another person or multiple people. Sometimes you go like, yeah, but I, I love to get certified and I love to go scuba diving, but none of my friends scuba diving. How do I solve the problem? Well, if you go to any uh, petty dive shop in the world, then you can just walk in and say, hey, I would like to do a fun dive. I'm certified, open water, advanced or any other level, but I have nobody to dive with. Then they say, oh, do a discover local diving or what we call a fun dive. And we have a dive guide for you and we put you in a little group and we have other people that some of them don't have other people to dive with also. So you can find a buddy. It's really cool. Now, if you go to a very small place where they might not have other people, then your dive guide will be your buddy. But never try to just grab stuff and just go, oh, there's water, let's go, you know, because that can, that can definitely cause problems. If you really want to dive by yourself and you think that's a cool feeling or adventure as well, then you can if you do the proper training, which is called the Betty Self-Reliant Diver. So if you want to know more information about that, then go and check with your instructor how to get certified in that. But for now, body systems are fantastic and I absolutely love it. So why for safety? I can go on for hours for this, but a couple of things. Remember what we said, if you get overexerted, you can hold onto your body, you can signal them, they can calm you down. If you might run too low on air or out of air, they will have an actual alternate air source under BCD in this triangular area that you can use and breathe from and still safely make it up to the surface.
They can remind you to not swim too fast, uh, maybe help you if you are getting too close to the coral. You can do body checks with a buddy. That means after you checked up your own equipment, uh, your buddy will check you out one more time before you go into the water just to be super safe. So there's just tons and tons and tons of reasons why a body system for safety is really good. By the way, if you don't know what a your body check is or it was a lot of steps and you can't really remember them during this petty open water dive course go to my videos and i actually made a really cool video about the body check in detail so whenever you get rusty on that one you can watch that to remind yourself all right so another one is practicality okay what is this well we we have to carry the dive equipment sometimes on land you know to the boat off the boat on land we need maybe extra stuff like spare kit with like for example spare mask spare fins we might want to have a first well we don't mind we want to have a first aid kit or some oxygen and all this stuff is heavy you need to carry it around and sometimes we can't do it all alone so having a body is really handy for helping each other carry equipment and reminding each other as well that we didn't forget things like the spare kit or the o2 or the first aid kit so that's really awesome too it helps as well on the boat it maybe helps is when we get a bit nervous and it can help us to calm down on the surface help us into the water into heavy equipment if maybe your back is not so good so there's tons of reasons why a body system can help with that and then the last one is fun you might go like yeah but what if my body is not fun I know there's a very rare chance that your body's maybe not so much fun than the other person but it's rare and and the most most bodies most people are really fun to hang out with and especially when you've been traveling by yourself already for some time then then having an extra person to share your travel stories with and and things like that is amazing and we really see people meeting each other on a on a fun dive during diving and then they go out of dinner together they travel on together and they become friends for life we even seen some marriages coming out of this so who knows maybe your lucky one uh, is there once you get certified and go scuba diving so it's it's definitely more fun but also like have you ever you know go to a beautiful i don't know a sightseeing thing in a city or on your holiday a beautiful viewpoint mountain lake things like that a beautiful animal that you just saw and you just want to share that with others and then there's no one around you if you're traveling alone so having that body on that dive is so cool because you can share all the great things that you've seen under the water talk about all the beautiful fish and corals and i know we got facebook and instagram and stuff like that to share things but uh, i think a real person is still better So should you already invest in your own scuba equipment right now? You might go a bit like, well, I'm just doing my open water diver course. I'm not sure yet if I would love scuba diving in the future. And I'm really low on budget or I'm traveling on a low budget. So I'm really not able to afford this full set or it's really heavy maybe to carry it around. So can I not scuba dive anymore? Yes, you can. Most dive shops in the world, they offer uh, to rent equipment or include equipment in their, in their course price, which means you got it all. So don't worry about it at all. However, having your own brand new equipment definitely is a, a little bit more comfortable in a lot of cases than the shop rental equipment. It's not unsafe shop rental equipment. It's not bad and it's not uncomfortable. But of course, if you're gonna buy a brand new a uh, shiny beautiful bcd that has all these extra you know pets in the back and just fits you perfectly yeah, of course you're going to be a bit more comfortable than maybe with a shop bcd which is a basic bcd that a lot of people have worn already before you it's kind of like you know buying a second hand car compared to a brand new car now when we're talking about cars some cars are much more affordable than other cars uh, which one drives better, which one is smoother and more comfortable, uh, sometimes looks a little bit better. Yeah, usually the one that's a little bit more expensive. So the same counts for diving equipment. If you invest a bit more money, you usually get a better design, uh, more stronger, more comfortable. And in a lot of cases, it's a bit of an opinion, but it looks usually a little bit better as well. So that's things that you should consider and what you should think about. Oh, I really want my own equipment. I love scuba diving, but it's too expensive to get all of it. Well, don't worry. Just do it in steps like most of us do. Maybe buy your scuba mask first with a snorkel. Then the next time you buy some fins, maybe the next time you buy a BCD or a wetsuit. 
Actually, the order in which you should buy equipment is a video that's in the making right now. So please subscribe to my channel, ring that notification bell, and then you will be notified when that video comes online, which I will give you really cool tips in what equipment you should invest in the beginning. So suitability, what does that really mean? Well, maybe you're gonna be diving mostly in cold water. So a thicker wetsuit would be better than a thinner wetsuit if you invest in it. Maybe you'll be diving in warm water. Oh, well, maybe a rash guard or a thin three millimeter shorty wetsuit so I don't have to spend too much money on a seven mil wetsuit. I'm not sure I'm gonna be diving in cold or warm water, maybe both. Well, now you know that you maybe can invest in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a thinner wetsuit and in a thicker wetsuit. If you're not sure the size or the thickness, you can just ask your instructor or any dive shop, a retail shop, or the salespeople in there will have all the information for you. For me, for example, what's really important is comfort and fit, especially fit. Because when you have loose fins, you know, the, the kicking is not efficient. When our BCD, this is a BCD, buoyancy control device, um, when this one is loose, then what happens is that the weight of the tank will become, uh, they go left and right, it becomes wobbly on your back like that. So it's hard to control your buoyancy. So if you're already struggling a little bit with buoyancy now, and you want to get better, then get yourself your own BCD. I particularly like this one, which is uh, the Glide from uh, Scuba Pro. And why is because it has this incredible soft, perfectly fitting harness for my body. I, I've actually never worn a BCD that fits as well as this BCD. So when I put it on, I was like, like that, like, you know, remember from Back to the Future with the shoes and the suit where you press the button, like that. It always gets reminded of that uh, scene when I wear this BCD. It just feels fantastic. I feel more comfortable, I feel safer, and I can control my buoyancy better, especially when I teach people, I want to be able to turn around. Now, you might go a bit like, well, that sounds a bit like a sales pitch right now. Should I buy that BCD? Well, this is the thing that's very important is that everybody's a bit different. All of our bodies are different. All of our, you know, what we, what we like under the water, what we, our feelings are different. So this might be the perfect BCD for me, but it might not be the perfect BCD for you. So that's why I always get proper advice from your instructor or in the retail shop from the salesperson. And some places, they even let you maybe try them out on an actual dive. They have these borrow BCDs, and then if you like it, you can buy it, or if you don't like it, you can get something else. So that's pretty awesome too, so you can look for that also. Yeah, and then fit, we kind of discussed that already, and comfort is kind of related to that as well. Especially with masks, uh, before we move on. I know I'm gonna do a whole video about this, but sometimes people just trying to sell you the most expensive mask yeah it might be in your case the best one but in the end if that is loose or you feel it's not really on your face then don't get it you know with the mask the fit is the most important thing and afterwards how comfortable it is or how much vision you have is also important but the fit is really important and everybody has a different face for me, it's important if I can equalize. As you can see a bit of a big nose here. So sometimes I have the best looking mask, but it kind of gets stuck on my nose. Oh, well. So I had to go for a little bit less good looking mask, but hey, it was a bit cheaper too, so that's kind of cool. All right, anyway, let's move on. Question number 14. Oh my God, we are almost there and almost finished with this Petty Open Water Diver Manual answers of chapter number one. So let's get into it and uh, finish this chapter. First of all, don't go diving with it, right? So have it inspected and surfaced as needed by a professional before using it. And how do you know it's a professional? Well, they need to have their special diplomas and licenses in surfacing a specific brand of equipment. So if you have, for example, an Aqualung regulator, you can bring it to a technician shop for scuba equipment, but if that person is not certified or licensed to surface Aqualung regulators, then you shouldn't go there. Even if that person is licensed to do another brand like Scuba Pro or can do it really well, it doesn't matter. Now, most technicians in scuba diving equipment, they have all the licenses. The best bet, if you're really unsure, is to bring it to the actual manufacturer where you bought the equipment from, so the, the brand. Uh, and of course, they will have the, the best professionals and engineers looking at your equipment. Now, normally when we buy new equipment, then after one year, it's very unlikely that the equipment is malfunctioning or it's not looking good. It sometimes still looks brand new. It also depends a bit how many dives have you've done. 
but regardless if it's good or not, we still surface it. So the recommendation is to surface your diving equipment at least once a year, even if it's in good shape. Now, in this case, when you're unsure, please check the manual of your dive equipment and follow the recommendation of your manufacturer. More important, always follow the local law. And you can also get some advice, of course, from your dive shop and your instructor. Now, if you do feel that something is off, and in this case, the regulator is breathing harder, and yeah, you might have just serviced it, or it might just be brand new, then don't just go, oh, it's not a year yet, so it should be okay. No, you definitely have to service it straight away. Uh, because yeah, things can break over time. And again, it also depends on how much you use it. Don't worry too much though, because with a good surface and the technicians put a big stamp on it, says it's okay, then you can definitely enjoy it again. So you don't have to buy new equipment all the time. First stages uh, from our regulator system is what we connect on the, on the scuba cylinder on the valve at the top. So it creates a connection. Now there's a couple of different connections that you can have, but the most common ones are the DIN. So a DIN regulator stands for Deutsche Industrie Norm, yeah, um, is a, a German designed uh, screw system. So what happens is that your first stage will have a screw that screws into the uh, valve of the, of the cylinder. There's also another system, which is called a yoke system, and it kind of creates a sort of pressure connection, so like that. It depends where you are in the world, what kind of valves they have on the tank, what kind of first stages they have at the dive shop, if you want to rent equipment, or what you have purchased. But don't worry, if you purchase a DIN regulator's first stage, and you go to a place in the world where they only have the, the yoke cylinder valves, then there's an adapter for that that you can use instead of buying a full new regulator. These adapters are very cheap, so if you don't have one yet, go and contact your instructor or go to your dive shop and, uh, and go and get yourself one of those adapters to take with you on traveling. Sometimes dive shops have them for you to borrow, but not always, so I, I recommend that you invest in one. Is there an adapter for the other way around? Absolutely, so it goes vice versa. There's multiple adapters. Question number 16 and the last question of this Petty Open Water Diver Manual answers chapter number one. Wow, it's such a mouthful, isn't it? Um, so uh, really cool that you are still around and let's finish this chapter. Okay, so we're gonna finish up the chapter number one with I think one of the most important questions and that's how buoyancy works and how do you control it? So remember that the most important rule is to never hold your breath. But I think one of the most important things to think about and to learn is good buoyancy control. The better your buoyancy, the more enjoyable your dives. The less air you consume, the safer the dive is, you won't touch any of the beautiful, delicate aquatic reef, uh, but you can still come close enough to enjoy it. So there are so many reasons why good buoyancy is important. And wherever you are, you always hear it, buoyancy, 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 buoyancy. So you might find out on your first dive or second dive that your buoyancy is not going to be that good. It might be, but you'll probably be a bit all over the place. And it's, it's tricky in the beginning, I really have to admit. Actually, I was really bad at buoyancy on my first diving experiences. My instructor called me a yo-yo diver. You know the yo-yo? <laughs> I was going up and down all the time. And I was trying to, um, you know, control my buoyancy with my jacket, with my BCD, by you can put air into your BCD. And release air if, if you get too much your instructor will practice this a lot with you and I was like inflating and deflating and breathing in and right and left and all over the place and I felt so bad about it especially because some of the other students they were just so good right um, was I a bad diver would I never have a chance well look at me now and I'm a course director so you just get better over time it is the same thing as learn to ride a bicycle the first time it's like, if you can still remember it, it's like, oh my God, it's like almost impossible. And, and then you go to sleep, that's when we learn. The next time, a little bit better, next time a little bit better. Before you know it, you know, you're, you're on a bicycle, going to a city, and, and you're seeing all these things happening at the same time and, and reacting on the traffic at exactly the same time. And that's the same with buoyancy. So if you are not so good on your first diving experience, don't worry about it, keep practicing. 
Now, what we're trying to achieve is what we call neutral buoyancy. So if this is the bottom and this is the surface, and this is you, so your head and your legs, then we're trying to be like in this position and then, you know, like kick and then sort of glide over the dive side. Kick, glide, and look at pretty stuff. Kick, glide, really chilled. And slow. That's it. What you don't want is that you're like bumping into the floor, in the bottom, reef, whatever, and then you have to swim yourself up, stirring all up the sand. You might be floating up all the time, which is also not good. It might be boats, or you might be have to swim down using a lot of energy. So you really want to sort of have the neutral buoyancy. And remember what I said, we achieve that while we displace the same amount of weight than what we weigh. But how much is that? With all your equipment on, it's really hard, right, to calculate. So that's why it's more like a feeling. And on your first dives, uh, you're gonna be practicing this buoyancy a lot with your instructor. And, and then once you get that feeling, he will take you closer uh, to the reef and, and you will see more things. So on your first dive experience, if you might not see that much aquatic life yet, don't be too disappointed. It's, it's probably for a reason because you have to learn buoyancy a bit first before we can enjoy the reef. The good thing about it is, is that your dives will always get better. So 50 dives are better than the first dive and 100 dives are better than 50 and 3000 dives are better than 100 dives because you just, you just keep improving this balance and feeling to the point you almost become like the matrix under the water and you just adjust buoyancy by just thinking about it. It's awesome. If you do find neutral buoyancy, what happens when we breathe in? We expand our lungs a little bit, we displace more water and we're going upwards. And every exhale, we actually make our lung a bit smaller, we displace a bit less water, and we start to sink if we're neutrally buoyant. So we really want to control our buoyancy mostly with our lungs. So we're swimming and we breathe in. And out. And in. And out. That's how we want to control our buoyancy. If you find yourself breathing in, but you're still like really going down to the bottom, then we need to have a bit of air in obesity. And the reason why this is happening is because you're probably gonna have some weights on your weight belt or in your BCD pocket, and you can integrate them in most BCDs like this to help you get down in the beginning. Never overweight yourself, that's really bad, but just maybe you know a little bit of weight can help you to get down. So then we're slightly negatively buoyant and it is harder than to find that neutral buoyancy just with your lungs. And that's where this BCD jacket comes into place. You just add a bit of air, like that. You can also do it orally if you want to, but this is easier. And then your BCD now starts to displace a little bit more water. So now we have neutral buoyancy and then with our, with our breathing in and out, we can control it a bit better. You might have to put a bit more air into it and a bit more, but if you keep pressing it, you're just gonna float up to the surface or it's a, it's a signal that you put too much weight on you, which is not good too. So a little bit is okay, not too much. If you accidentally do put too much air in your BCD and you start to float up, which is very common in the beginning when you dive, don't worry too much too, because it's also designed to let air out with this button. So you just put it up as high as possible and you go and then all this air will come out here and then while exhaling, you sink down slowly again. Do make sure that you equalize again when that happens. This whole floating up and down will happen a lot on your dive number one for most people. Again, don't worry, your instructor is there to give you great tips. And once you get that feeling, it's a, it's a pretty awesome feeling, I can tell you. And it's, it's like, it's, it gets you really close to outer space. Like, you know, you're weightless, you're, you're almost flying. You see a lot of people, I like to do it too sometimes, like we like to spread our hands like this sometimes when you just go to the water like that. I know it's geeky, but I love it. It's just your, your, your bird uh, in outer space. You're an astro bird. Okay, that was too geeky. All right, anyway, so much more about buoyancy from your instructor during this petty open water dive, of course, you're gonna practice it a lot. Uh, uh, don't worry right now if you don't get it, you will get it. Anyway, that's the uh, last question and the end of the Petty Open Water Diver Course Manual Answers of Chapter Number One. 
I hope that you liked it. I hope that you learned something that it helps you to prepare for your open water diver course. And if it did, then please do not forget to smash that like button down there as it helps me so much and uh, subscribe and ring that bell because as you can see already right here in the screen, the next video is popping up. So please check out this next video here. And if you don't have time to do it right now, then you will get notifications all the time when I upload new scuba diving training videos. If you also really liked it, it would mean the world to me if you can share this video on your social media. And if you want to maybe say thank you to me, down here there is a join button. And if you click on that, you can become a member of this channel. And for a very small fee, uh, you support me as a channel to, uh, to keep making you new content. And at the same time, you're gonna get some really cool things in return, like cool little special emojis and perks. And everything is explained when you click on that join button. Now, last but not least, if you're already thinking about, wow, I love this so much, I wanna be a diving instructor like us, then I am a Petty Platinum course director, which means I teach monthly Petty IDC course. And uh, if you want to join my Petty instructor course, then look down in the description, there's a link, click on that, and then you get in contact with me and I love to chat about your future in the scuba diving world. All right, again, please check out my next video right over here and I wish you a fantastic day and enjoy scuba diving.